The Buffalo Bills won their fourth game in a row and collected their second divisional win of the season. And I'm here to talk about what matters most coming out of the win over the Jets today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day. And as a reminder to you, we are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Happy Victory Monday to you. The Buffalo Bills defeated the Jets 20 to 12 and improved to 10 and 3 on the season. That's right. The Buffalo Bills have double digit wins for the fourth consecutive season. And there's still four games to play. Imagine if I told you in 2016 that in 2022, the Buffalo Bills will have collected their fourth consecutive double digit win season. That's the world that we live in right now. Let's talk about this game. Let's talk about this win over the Jets. And I got to tell you, I thought Joe DiBiase from WGR 550 had the perfect tweet after the game. This is what he said. The Bills just won a bad weather one score game against a physical team with an elite defense breaking all the narratives. I honestly can't believe some of the takes and opinions that are coming out of this game. The defense was terrific against the hot offense, and the offense, well, it didn't play well, but it was cold, wet, and windy against a top-shelf NFL defense. And honestly, there were some plays that they could have made that would have made this look like a route. Let's talk about what happened here. We'll start with things I liked, and then we'll get into things I didn't like, and then, of course, visit my predictions, which I did not do well on. Things I liked. We got to start with the defense, and I want to begin that conversation by discussing the defensive ends and how they once again stepped up without Von Miller. I mean, these dudes made some game-changing plays. Gregory Rousseau, two sacks, including a strip sack, tackle for loss, pass breakup, two quarterback hits. This young man is turning into a force. Very excited to see him in the lineup and for him prospering. And I got to be honest, I just wish I could see Greg Rousseau, Ed Oliver, and Von Miller on the field healthy together. And we're not going to get that chance this year. But Gregory Rousseau is developing wonderfully right before our eyes. He was dynamic in this game. How about A.J. Epinesa? Five tackles, a strip sack, tackle for loss, quarterback hit. And he iced the game with that pass breakup on the 4th and 10. Batted it down at the line of scrimmage. He was outstanding. He was outstanding last week as well. I think he's up to like five and a half sacks on the year. Shaq Lawson. Another outstanding game from Shaq. A sack, tackle for loss, quarterback hit. Outstanding against the run. Stayed home against cutbacks and misdirections. Just a fundamentally sound football player, and he proves it every single week. Those guys were outstanding in this ball game. I thought the defensive line, the front in general, they controlled the line of scrimmage. The defensive tackles played really well in this game, and it doesn't show up in the stat sheet like it does for the defensive ends, but Daquan Jones, Ed Oliver, and Tim Settle, they controlled the line of scrimmage. Thought especially Jones and Settle showed up big time in this game. Settle with some big time moments to maintain his leverage and get off blocks and make some tackles as well. I thought, I think he's kind of coming along here over the last several weeks. But that front was outstanding once again. How about those linebackers, Tremaine Edmonds and Matt Milano? They were dynamic like they've been all season long. 
Matt Milano, nine tackles, tackle for loss, a couple of pass breakups, recovered a fumble. Tremaine was flying around, making some physical tackles, getting into throwing lanes. Those guys are playing so well off of each other. And that starts with the defensive line doing their job. That second level, those guys, Edmonds and Milano, when they're on the field together and healthy, man, they're a force. Thought Teron Johnson had some big moments, pass breakup, a couple of pass breakups, physical tackles. Same thing with Jordan Poyer. I mean, I can't believe Jordan Poyer is able to get guys down with with that elbow, but, man, he shows up every week and competes. The Bills haven't lost a game this year. When Poyer's in the lineup, they're 9-0. and You know, safety wins, right? Our, Bruce Nolan, our, safe, our win's a safety set, stat. <laughs> oh, man, the Bills win whenever he plays, so that's fun. DeMar Hamlin had that big forced fumble. That was as big of a play as there was in this game, and he made it. He forced that ball out. Now, we'll talk about some things that didn't go well for the defense in a bit, but those guys answered the call today. They owned the line of scrimmage, and they made game-changing splash plays. The Jets had 13 offensive drives. Seven of them they punted on. And the defense gave up 10 points. Just an outstanding day for Leslie Frazier's defense. Makes a big difference when you got Milano and Poyer in there, right? And Rousseau, remember Rousseau against the Jets the first time. He didn't play the second half. Those guys made a big-time impact. There's things that I liked about the offense. Not that much, but I have some good things to say. We'll elaborate a little bit more here in a moment. But I thought for the offense, they had some really good moments more than anything else. The touchdown pass to Dawson Knox was an absolutely insane play. Great throw by Josh Allen to fit it into that window kind of over top of the second level. And then an amazing catch and run. I mean, what just an unbelievable finish to that play for him to kind of somersault into the end zone. And then somehow, like when I watched it live, I thought his I thought the ball was going to touch before the goal line. But because he flipped in the way that he did and the way that his body kind of carried him. He never touched the ground, and the ball went with him into the end zone. I, I've not seen a touchdown like that. That was really fun. That was a big-time play. Really ugly start to the game, but somehow that play happens, and you're up seven at halftime. You felt good about that. It changes. It changed my perspective and outlook for the rest of the game for sure. Just a great play, great throw, great run, great touchdown. How about the opening drive of the second half? The second play of that drive was the 32-yard catch and run from Allen to Diggs. Really good job getting him ISOed up against a safety. Quick throw and then run after catch for 32 yards. Four plays later, the Bills are in the end zone courtesy of a Josh Allen rushing touchdown from five yards out. Speaking of the red zone, the Bills were two of two perfect scoring touchdowns in this game when they got to the red zone, and they've scored a touchdown eight of their last nine trips into the red zone. So for something that was an issue earlier this season, they've really shored that up of late. I also thought Devin Singletary ran the ball well in this game, eight rushes for 39 yards. I kind of wish he got some more opportunities. I know he had the drop pass and the Bills had a bazillion drop passes, but I thought when Devin had chances to run the ball, he did well. There's some things that I want to mention on special teams that I liked here. Tyler Bass was a perfect two of two on field goals. He hit from 38 and 49 and, of course, made both of his extra points. It's a tough environment to kick. Cold, wet, and windy. That ain't easy to make kicks, especially a 49-yarder. They put the Bills up 13. It was a big kick. Sam Martin, the Bills punter, was terrific in this ballgame. Absolutely boomed the football. Flipped the field multiple times and put the coverage units in good positions to down the football or make tackles. Speaking of the coverage units, they were outstanding. Kick and punt return all game long. This was one of those games where your ability to punt and cover kicks was huge, and I thought the Bills did a great job of that. And you could look at some of those returns that Naheem Hines had, whether it was a 23-yard punt return, the 17-yard punt return. Somehow when the Bills got, we'll talk about it in a minute, but they got the ball after a Naheem Hines punt return. It was returned 23 yards. They got it to the 50. Unfortunately, they couldn't score, but Hines put him in a good spot. 
The 17-yard punt return that he had later in the game put the Bills in position to score a field goal with a short field and to go up 20-7. to And so look at how the Bills covered kicks and punts and compare it to the Jets, and you can see that that was a difference in the ball game. I also love that the Bills won the turnover battle 2-0. to zero. So you get two turnovers, you get two takeaways, you don't turn it over yourself in this type of game. It matters, right? Cold, wet, windy. Two good defenses. You knew it was going to be this type of game. And you did a good job of taking care of the football, taking away the football, and winning in the kicking game. It's a great job. There's some fun facts that I really like from this game. Josh Allen's rushing touchdown was the 37th of his career, tying Steve McNair for fourth most all-time by a quarterback in the history of the league. That's fun, right? Josh Allen, fourth all-time in the history of the NFL in rushing touchdowns by a quarterback. I like this one. If Josh Allen gets four touchdowns against Miami on Saturday, he will tie Dan Marino for the most touchdowns by a player in the first five years of that of their career in the history of the NFL. How fun would that be to do it against the Dolphins to tie that record? If he gets six, he breaks it. It's a matter of time. He's going to get that done this year, but it'll be fun to do that this week. Dawson Knox called in his 17th career receiving touchdown. That tied him. That ties him with Scott Chandler for third most touchdowns in franchise history by a tight end. Jay Reimersma is ahead of him with 20. Pete Metzelars has 25. There's going to come a point in time next year where we recognize Dawson Knox as the most prolific touchdown catcher among tight ends in the history of the organization. <laughs> oh, it's only a matter of time there. And then Stefan Diggs, he moved into fifth place all time in receptions for the team. He is 324 and not even three full seasons with the team. So those are some fun facts here that I really enjoyed coming out of this ball game. We're going to talk about things I didn't like here in just a moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Turo. Turo is the world's largest car sharing marketplace. With Turo, you can book any car that you want, wherever you want it, from a community of local hosts. You can browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget across the U.S., U.K., Canada, and coming soon to Australia. You can book a spacious SUV or minivan for a family road trip or get a classic or luxury car for a special event, birthday, or holiday. You can even find affordable economy cars if you're on a budget and just need to get from A to B. You can test drive that new electric vehicle you've had your eye on to see how it fits into your everyday life. Many Turo hosts can even deliver the car right to you. Every trip is backed by liability insurance. Terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Forget boring rental cars and find your drive at Turo.com. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is releasing a slate of new football podcasts that we're sure you're going to love. You can find Think Like a Champion now wherever you get your podcast. Think Like a Champion is a brand new podcast from Russell Wilson and Audible. Russ is a champion on the field, but off of it, we rarely get to know the grind on the path to greatness. Russell Wilson will dig into how high-performance athletes, artists, and leaders push the boundaries of their potential. You can even hear from two-time Super Bowl champion and MVP Von Miller, where he delivers sharp insights about performing at your highest level in moments of extreme pressure. Or even hear from NCAA champion Tim Tebow and hear him discuss how to find your unique personal mission in the world. So head over to Locked On Presents for a sneak peek of Think Like a Champion or catch the full series available anywhere you get your podcasts. Available everywhere right now. Audible. Get in the game. Let's talk about some things that I didn't like here, and obviously we're going to focus a lot on the offensive side of the football. A lot of missed opportunities in this ball game for the offense, especially early. The game started ugly. It was a punt fest, right? The first 10 drives of this ball game were all punts, five for each team. And of course, when you start the game with five consecutive punts, it seems like people lose in the entire perspective of context and that the Bills are playing a really, really good defense in cold, wet, and windy conditions. And everybody was very, very I mean, I saw people saying they're out on Ken Dorsey. This is the third most amount of yards the Bills have ever had 
at this point in the season in the history of the team. And that doesn't even include any years that Brian Dable was there. This team is obviously not a dominant offense right now. They're not. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that they are. But they're still doing quite well. Let's let's look at some of those missed opportunities early. And you're going to notice that none of this has anything to do with Ken Dorsey. And I'm not sitting here saying that I don't think there's some meat on the bone for Ken Dorsey and there's ways that he can be improved. But I'm not, I'm also not sitting here calling for this guy's head like I'm seeing some people. The first drive of the game, third and two. Stefan Diggs was wide open in the middle of the field. Wide open. There was a safety probably 15 yards down the field that maybe could have made a tackle in space. But if Josh Allen just hits that very easy throw, I mean, there's a pretty good chance that Stephon Diggs takes it to the house. You know what I'm talking about? That third play of the game. Diggs was wide open. Josh couldn't get it to him. What's that got to do with Ken Dorsey? Everybody wants him to scheme up wide open players. Well, he did it. He did it. Josh didn't hit the throw. What's that got to do with Ken Dorsey? Second drive of the game. A bomb to John Brown. Missed opportunity, right? Ball was a touch underthrown. It was definitely pass interference by Sauce Gardner. But at the end of the day, it's an incomplete pass, and two plays later, the Bills punt. Ken Dorsey schemed up a great opportunity for the Bills to hit a chunk play. Ball was underthrown, and the officials missed a pass interference. What's that got to do with Ken Dorsey? Third drive of the game, third and 16. Isaiah McKenzie dropped the football. Perfectly thrown ball by Josh Allen. Not a hard catch, not hard at all. A routine catch I'd expect an NFL wide receiver to make. He dropped it. Isaiah McKenzie had several drops in this game. The dude has two good games in a row, and then he had to remind you that he's still a very inconsistent football player in this one with his drops. Third and 16. Dropped it in the bucket. Couldn't bring it in. How about the fifth drive of the game? You start first and 10 from the 50. From the 50. First and 10. Josh Allen's your quarterback. You get a 23-yard punt return from Naheem Hines. You go three and out. And obviously, the drive got derailed on a third and five. or third. It was a third and two. It was a five-yard play. They got a first down. It's called back due to a Deion Dawkins holding call. Ghost call to me. I didn't see holding. Takes it back. The Bills are in a third and 12. Have to punt the ball after starting first and 10 from your own, from the 50. Some other things I didn't like from the offense. Fast forward to 534 left in the ball game. Bills lead 20-9. to nine. That sequence sucked when they got the ball. First and 10. Cook minus two yards on first down. Then you have a one-yard completion to Diggs on second and 12. You get a Roger Saffold false start. Now it's third and 16, a one-yard run from Singletary. You punt on fourth and 15 from the 17. With five and a half left in the ball game, you're up two scores. You're trying to bleed clock. Didn't love that. And then, so the Jets, they get a field goal. And all of a sudden, you have another opportunity to ice the game. One minute and 18 seconds left. You're up 20 to 12. On first down, the Jets have all three of their timeouts. So they're in a pretty good spot. You throw it up a, a deep shot to Dawson Knox. Looks like it was a good opportunity, right? Certainly a throw you'd expect Josh Allen to make and a catch you'd expect Dawson Knox to haul in. It was a tough catch. Maybe the ball was a little bit underthrown. Had a little bit of a contact situation that Dawson Knox needed to be able to play through. Couldn't couldn't connect. And so now you you do an aggressive thing, and it's hard to fault it because the play was there to be made. But you're, now you're in a spot where you didn't force them to take a timeout. The clock's not running, and it was kind of a missed opportunity. It kind of falls right into line with those, those first three sequences that I talked about where just couldn't connect on a throw that was there. So then you get a four-yard run from Singletary, a Josh Allen one-yard run, and then you punt the ball to the Jets and give them a chance to tie up the ball game with a timeout in their back pocket. You didn't, you didn't force them to burn all their timeouts. Going back to that Josh Allen one-yard run, my goodness, did Josh miss the read there, huh? 
He didn't read the blocks well at all. He went inside. Morse and Saffold were perfectly leveraged. And Josh goes inside right where, right where they were blocking him. Would have been a monster run. Maybe even a touchdown. Instead, you punt the ball and give the Jets a chance to tie up the ball game. Josh missed the read. So, look, there's a lot of things in here. Maybe I wish that they ran the football a little bit more at times. Maybe I wish that they used some of the short passing game and got the running backs involved a bit more in this game, at least not just running the ball, but catching the ball out of the backfield. But I thought Ken Dorsey had this offense in some great positions to make some really big plays, and the Bills didn't make any of them. Tough and sloppy day for this offense. Penalties were an issue. They're 2 of 13 on third down. You only have 232 yards. Pass protection wasn't consistent. Penal- like I said, penalties kind of piled up at times. And I and I definitely thought they missed some chances to run the football more than they did, especially after Quinn and Williams went down. You didn't really test that as, as much as I wish they did running the football. Defensively, some things I didn't like. Dane Jackson, he continues to have challenges playing the ball. That Braxton Berrios reception, that wasn't a hard play for Dane to, to break on the ball and, and force an incompletion. Didn't get there, couldn't find the ball. There were other instances as well. But for as effective as the defense was with limiting points and coming up with splash plays, the Jets are 8 of 17 on third down. That's not where you want them to be. They had some long third down conversions allowed against them, a couple of third and 10s, a third and 12. It's like, what is going on here? Get off the damn field. Tackling issues popped up once again. Damar Hamlin, A.J. Epinesa, Trey White, Dane Jackson. They all fell victims to to what I would label as egregious whiffs. We'll see the numbers tomorrow and understand just how many missed tackles there were, but the Bills really have to be more consistent tackling. And and look, I'm a reasonable human being. I don't expect them to make every single play. But man, you can't just be like egregiously whiffing and falling off tackles. And, you know, that's that's gotta stop, man. Especially, especially Dane Jackson. I think he's just really hurting this team with missed tackles and not playing the ball in the air. Makes you really wonder about Kyer Elam needing to be that guy or Xavier Rhodes needing to be that guy opposite of uh of Trey White. But I'm sure it has something to do with the scheme and reliability and Dane Jackson getting to his landmarks. But man, he's feels like he t- he gives up quite a bit. Looking for him to step up the rest of the way if he's going to be on the field. And then of course they didn't like the blocked punt. I don't blame Sam Martin at all. He's got to rely on his protection to get the punt off. And it looked to me like A.J. Klein missed his assignment. I'll have to go back and watch you all 22, but I felt like he was the one that whiffed on that play and allowed the the you know the punt block, which was fortunately a safety. Kept the kept it a two-score game, but your lead went from 13 to 11, and all of a sudden they don't need two two uh touchdowns. They need a touchdown, a two-point conversion, and a field goal. And so they were in position to get that. Fortunately, the Bills' defense bowed up, and they didn't, but that block punt made it an easier path for the Jets. I hope you've been getting in on the action over at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is my favorite daily fantasy resource. How does it work? You pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on an, on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available and they have projections on any sport that you watch. So not just the NFL, but NBA, NHL, golf, soccer, you name it, you can find it, and entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It is that easy. So download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. So if you deposit 100, Prize Picks will give you 100. If you deposit 50, Prize Picks will give you 50. Just don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Let's close this thing out by looking at my predictions and talking a little bit about what's next for the bills. Now, as for my predictions, folks, I did bad. Now, I will say this: the one thing that I didn't account for in these predictions was the elements. Right, I wasn't. 
looking at this through the lens of a cold, wet, windy football game. And maybe that's something I should have thought more about. It's Western New York. It's December. That stuff happens. So <laughs> let's work through it here as I take L after L after L. I said the Bills would score 24 or more points. Uh, that didn't happen. The Bills scored 20, which I will say is more than the Jets are allowing on average this season. On average, they allowed 18 and a half. The Bills got to 20. And uh, as we talked about with some of the missed opportunities, they certainly had a chance to score a lot more than that. Number two, I said eight or more catches from the Bills running backs. That didn't happen. They only had three. And I would say that was a missed opportunity. The Bills should have gotten those running backs involved more in the passing game. They didn't. They only had three catches. So I missed on that. I said the Bills will have 250 or more passing yards. <laughs> that didn't happen. They got 130. 130. Some yards out there to be had, though, I'll tell you that. Didn't finish plays. A lot of drops. A lot of drops in this ballgame. I said the Bills would intercept Mike White. That didn't happen. But they did sack him four times and force him to fumble twice. Um, but he get, Milano had a chance at a pick for sure. Um, but I'm not sure they really got that close on any other breaks on the ball. Um, but yeah, Mike White couldn't intercept him. So he, the Bills now have not intercepted a pass in the last four games or five of the last six. So they, the last one, two, three, four, the last five games, the Bills have faced Zach Wilson, Jacoby Brissett, Jared Goff, Mac Jones, and Mike White have no interceptions to show for it. Hopefully, you know, they're due for some interceptions. So hopefully they come on Saturday night against Miami. Now, here's the prediction I did get. I said the Bills would win the game. And damn it, they won the game. We got that one right. I think everyone would sign up for me missing every single prediction as long as I predict the Bills to win and that happens. But yeah, it wasn't, I didn't, like I said, I, did, I just didn't feel the, or I just didn't consider the the elements enough in this ball game. Um, so it is what it is. I go one for five. I'm recording this podcast today before the Dolphins play on Sunday night football against the Chargers, but go Chargers. But the result of that game doesn't matter because the Bills control their own destiny. So no matter what happens, when you're listening to this podcast, the Bills are the number one seed in the AFC and, of course, the top spot in the AFC East division. Now, if the Chargers win the game, obviously that would be good for the Bills because they'd have a little bit more wiggle room within the division. Next for the Bills, though, is a head-to-head -head matchup at home Saturday night against the Miami Dolphins. You win that game, you're going to be in a really good position to win your third consecutive AFC East title. You get to play at home, and the Chargers, or excuse me, the Dolphins are kind of in a tough spot where they played in San Francisco. They stayed on the West Coast, played in Los Angeles on Sunday night, and then... They play in Buffalo on Saturday night. So it's a short week on the road, third consecutive road game. I'm sure these dudes' bodies are all out of whack. And, oh, by the way, you're a team from South Florida where it's probably, what, 75, 80 degrees? I got a feeling it's going to be a little chilly Saturday night in western New York. And I think that's exactly how we want it. All right, folks, tomorrow, herd mentality on the podcast, and then we'll spend the rest of the week getting ready for a big matchup against the Miami Dolphins. So don't miss anything. Make sure that you are subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Enjoy this Victory Monday, and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.